won't need to have the, the mic, right? Um, anyways, I'm, by way of introduction, I'm, my name's Larry Smith, as she said, and um, I, uh, I've been, uh, I been I've lived in Rochester my whole life. Um, I'm a member of the Wooden Canoe Heritage Association. Um, <clears throat> I'm a, uh, an average woodworker and an above-average do-it-yourselfer, and um, I, uh, I like to do a lot of flat water paddling. So I don't like to go down rapids and that kind of stuff. Uh, the canal is really nice for me, and um, and uh, so anyways, and I'm also a ballroom dancer, as she mentioned, and uh, I'm a quality engineer, which will probably become apparent as I go through the, the uh, uh, my presentation here. Uh, and to go back to when I met Grace, we were talking about we were dancing, and of course I'm kind of new to it. I'm not nearly as uh, as good as as, uh, as Grace is, and I said, well, Grace, you know. Dancing's a lot like paddling a canoe. It's always a good icebreaker, right? And and I said, if I have somebody in the bow of my canoe and they're not paddling correctly, I give them a couple of chances to do it right. But if they're not doing it right, I say, pull the paddle out of the water now. I said, if I start dancing like that, please correct me. So she said, that's fine. Okay, well, so now, here's the beginning of my story. Okay. You notice he's got all these first wild institutions up here. What do you think they all have in common? At least one Smith kid went to each one of them. Okay? So I don't have a lot of disposable income. So when I like, when I came to uh, when I came to want to have a hobby, the uh, the canoe the canoeing hobby is a good one, but if you have to buy everything pre-made, which you know that's sometimes you have to do, um, then uh, you know, it costs you quite a bit more. And with the way you build these canoes, it takes enough time longer that uh, you get a, a great chance to enjoy it. You can't spend the money that fast because you can't build the, the you can't build the boat that fast. So anyway, so thanks to these institutions, I got into building wood canoe. Now, what we're going to talk about uh, canoes real briefly here is that canoes were adapted from the native boats and. Uh, they're lighter and stronger than the than the boats that the French brought over here early on. Uh, the, the the bateau that they brought were very heavy, and uh, of course our native peoples they built they built the canoes and they were wonderful. They were wonderful because they're much lighter. They're pointed on both ends, so they can be carried from lake to lake. Where the, the European boats they never thought of doing that. It was you know if you put it in the lake you you, you moved around there. So, uh, and it can carry much more cargo than its weight. Uh, some of the French voyageurs, they made these canoes that were 20, 25, 30 feet long. They can carry, carry several tons in a, in a, in a voyageur canoe. So, anyway, um, my first picture here, that boat's not a canoe. So, one of the, one of the things that distinguishes a canoe is that you paddle a canoe. And, Anything else you you can row. You now sometimes you can set up rowing rigs at canoes, but officially you paddle a canoe. That is an Adirondack guidebook. And being that this is the ADK, this is a boat that's that's native to New York. And really, the true Adirondack guideboats are only found in New York. Um, and the, the the thing is, that this is pointed on both ends, but there's more locks in the middle. Um, let's see if I can work this thing. Um, yeah. There's war locks in the middle, and the idea with the guide boat was that you had guides that were up in the Adirondacks, and they would take the sports out. So a guy from New York City would come up, and they'd give him a paddle, and he'd sit down here, and the guide would face him, and he'd row. He'd row. These are the fastest boats in the water, on the Adirondack guide boat. They can go by a canoe like it's standing still, um, and that's because you got twice the power, you got a lot of leverage. Um, but it is, a, it is a fine distinction, so I wanted to make sure everybody saw that. That, by the way, is, uh, that boat's hanging in the uh, cafeteria at Paul Smith's College up in, uh, up in uh, Paul Smith's, which is north of Saranac Lake. Okay, now here's a family portrait. These are four boats that, um, that we, we took, uh, I had up uh, this last summer. Uh, we've got a, uh, a strip-built boat like, like mine. There's my boat right there, uh, which is the sister to the, the, the mate to this boat right here. This is the boat my son built. And then this boat here is a, uh, what's called a wood canvas canoe. And that's made where it has, uh, 
It has ribs inside of it, and then it, the ribs are clench nailed. Uh, there's uh, strips of wood on the outside that are clench nailed, and the whole thing is covered with canvas. You can you, you cover it like you cover a chair, and they paint it with a bunch of coats of uh, really heavy paint, and that's what makes it waterproof. Those are the traditional Old Town canoes. When you hear about Old Town, a lot of the times, and, and the canoes that came out from like around 1900 to about, they were popular until about 1940s. Whereupon we got the, uh, we got the Grumman canoes, the big aluminum canoes that you're all probably familiar with from the Boy Scouts. And Grumman was an aircraft company and they made, uh, you know, fuel tanks. And a fuel tank on an airplane and a canoe looked an awful lot the same. So they, they start after the war making, making canoes. Um, the, uh, the, they're a little heavy, the, the aluminum canoes are a little heavy, but boy, I'll tell you what, if you don't want to do maintenance, that's the boat for you because you can leave it out 365 days a year, you know, as long as it doesn't go away, you're in good shape. Uh, your wood canvas canoe definitely has to be inside, out in the sunlight, uh, and, and pro preferably upside down. My, uh, my, my strip built boats, I kind of baby them. I do leave them, in the, I leave them in the garage and keep them out of the sun because the sunlight affects the, uh, the, sunlight affects the, uh, the epoxy resin. Uh, let's see, I'm not a great, uh, great one for uh, PowerPoint here, but there's a wood canvas boat in its natural state, upside down with the canvas off. They're repairing it. And what, what's going on here? There's some new patches that they're putting on it, and they're, they're clenched down on those patches. They also have to put in some new ribs, and the ribs are all steam bent. Okay, so what they do is they have a form that looks like the boat upside down. And they take the bits of wood, and they put them into a steam box, and they steam them until they're al dente, you know, so that they're like, like, like pasta, and then they bend them over the form. And then when they cool, they'll stay in that shape. And so the whole boat is built that way. It's, it's quite a process to see done. There is a, uh, that's, this is a Canadian boat. Um, and this, is, this is the original style of this strip boat. This was built, bef this was made before we got into fiberglass. This boat depends on the carpentry to keep the water on. And so building a boat like this, it's, this is really a very rare boat because not many of these survive. Uh, one of the things that has to be done with a boat like this is in the springtime they sink it and let it slip up, let it swell up a little bit so it'll, uh, it'll float better. And uh, it's kind of hard to see in this picture, but um, it's got uh, a lot of little tiny half ribs, little tiny quarter round ribs through, and they're about a, an inch apart. That's a, but that's a beautiful, that's a really beautiful boat. And then there is a, there's a strip built boat. These are a, 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 whole, a whole bunch of strip built boats. And this is uh, taken at one of our assemblies down in, uh, down in Pennsylvania. And as you can see in here, there's a, a couple of strip-built kayaks, right? They have the, they have the, the, full, um, the full deck and the shrouding around and the spray skirt. And, uh, you know, and you can see also they do stuff with different colored woods and really can be very beautiful boats. And there's a picture of my boat. Um, sitting there, and I just thought that was just a beautiful, a beautiful picture. So that's what I have to keep. And this is uh, this is my boat up on Lime Kiln Lake with my son Matt. <coughs> he's a uh, he's the one. He's looking out over. Uh, well, he's looking out over Lime Kiln. He's got that that far away look in his eye. Uh, uh, my son Matt is uh, he he goes to Plattsburgh State, and he's taking uh, expeditionary studies. And for his senior project, he paddled the length of the Mekong River in Cambodia. Uh, it took him two months, um, and um, so you know it, that was his. That was his. Uh, you know, his, when he was a little a little guy, I took him out in that boat in uh, Menden Pond. So I guess he never really wanted to get out of the boats. But he's uh, hoping to become a professional guy, and he was telling me he's looking for a job down in Patagonia, <laughs> and uh, he's got a summer job going back and forth across the Puget Sound. You know, leading tours across the Puget Sound. So I, I promise Grace that if we if we ever get him here for a long long enough period of time, we're going to have him come and talk about paddling around in the around in Asia. So now this is this is how a stripper starts, and we got uh, there's the strips of wood on the side. There's the, we're starting with strips of wood, and here's a strip right here. 
they're usually, uh, this is basically cedar, and it's uh, what you call a D or better cedar, so it's a uh, no knots. And uh, you don't buy it this way, you buy it in one by six or one by eight or four. Uh, sometimes you buy it in decking, which is five quarter, which is actually fully one inch. And then you rip it down into these strips, and you turn them into a lot of sawdust. So that's the part that kills you because the, the width of your saw blade is almost the width of your strip. So you turn a lot of it into sawdust. And this is uh, this is a close up. This is uh, by the way, this is Al Bratton. He's one of our premier uh, cedar strip canoe builders. But you see, he's, he's stapling the strip onto the form. Okay. Now those forms are the shape of the canoe. All right. And I got a couple of them here. These are the forms that we're making. In build this boat. And you, what you do is you put them all together on a frame like we got here, and then you put the strips on the side and you staple them on. You glue each strip to, to the next strip. All right, so here we go. We got the sequence diagram here. So uh, this is, um, okay, so this top row is all the work that you have to do to um, you got to build up a strong back. You know, the strong back is, is the, the bench, basically, that you build the canoe on. And then you, you uh, build the forms. You have to cut the forms out. And then you mount the forms on the back. So there's a whole bunch of work that you end up doing that is never going to see the water. It's all just what it takes to build the boat. Um, and then you, you attach the forms to the strong back. Then I got making of the, of the stems. The stem. Got a point to it. The stem is this part right here. And as you can see on both of these boats, that stem is, is, is a piece of bent wood. And I didn't have to do a little steam bending to do that. And the steam bending, I steam them, I, I took them and put them in a pipe with a tea kettle underneath until they got nice and soft. They were about a quarter inch long, then you bend them over the you bend them over a, a, a one of these forms, and then you know you they, they, they dry off, you glue them together, and then you can you sand them down. But that's quite a process in and of itself. And there's a lot of work, it's a lot of man hours that went into that. And then there's all this about building, about making the stock. So you have to you have to get the stock, and then you have to rip it. You rip it down into these quarter inch wide strips. Actually, you want to rip them a little thicker than quarter. I found that out the hard way. Uh, and then you um, you prepare the hull stock by running through a thickness plane. This is something we learned really, really important. If you guys are into, if you want to think about this, the thickness planer takes and makes both sides of the wood nice and smooth, and it, and it makes it exactly a quarter inch thick. You want to get a 250,000 thick. In fact, I was using a caliper, you know, a, a metalworking caliper to get them that, get them the right thickness. And I did that because the next step is to put the bead and cove on here. And I have to show you this. This is a. It's a finer point, but these four, these pieces will interlock with each other. Okay, so it's rounded on one side, and then it's coved on the other. And so um, they, they, they lock into each other. So you put a bead of glue in there. And also when you're going around the, the, the bilge, or you're going around the, the side of the boat, they're not straight. If they were straight on the edge, there'd be gaps in there. So you put these bead and cove on there so they lock together so it makes it much, much stronger and much easier to do. It also kind of helps you when you're putting them together. That was the other thing I was going to point out. If you, if you look at the bow right about in the middle of the, uh, of the stem here, there's one strip that starts off that's vertical at the stems and horizontal when it's in the middle. So it's got a twist in it like that. And let me tell you, that is tough to get it to twist like that, and then to get it to go up tight to the up tight to the other boards. So there's a little bit of work involved in, in getting the, the stock right. And then, of course, there's the the uh, the next thing is getting the fiberglass. The whole boat is covered with fiberglass cloth. It doesn't look like it, but the fiberglass cloth. I have a sample of it over here. Here's a fiberglass cloth, and then it's, you know, un untreated state. This is what it looks like. You put it on the boat, and then you wet it out with uh, epoxy, clear epoxy resin. It disappears. It's amazing. I, you know, the first time you see it, you don't think it's going to work, but 
you know, you just get it wet and then the, the glass becomes clear. The epoxy is extremely strong. Uh, I've seen one of these boats turn sideways in the creek between, on a bridge pump, right? There was a, a culvert and the boat was turned up like this. And the water was running into the wrong side of it. And it's got in there, popped it, now she came. So um, they are pretty amazing. I've seen them fall off the cars too. So the epoxy, epoxy is the best, is the, is the new, um, the newer material they use. Previous to epoxy, they were using a polyester resin. The polyester resin smells like Bondo. If you guys are familiar with working on, on cars, the Bondo smell will just about drive you crazy. The epoxy has a, um, well, I like it because it reminds me of both, but uh, it has a, it doesn't smell any worse than, say, paint with an oil-based paint or something like that. So it's pretty easy, pretty easy to work with. The only thing with the epoxy, you open the epoxy up, you start to put your first bit of epoxy in the boat, you're committed. No phone calls, no TV, no bathroom breaks. You gotta keep moving because if it's if you stop at any point and it starts to harden up, you can't restart the epoxy and you get a, a, a mark or a, a spot that isn't fully wetted out. So you'll be able to see the weed. If you look at these boats closely, you'll see there's a couple of spots that look like that. So anyway, so then and then you do the you know you put the you gotta put the fiberglass on the outside of the boat, which is not too bad. Then you have to clean up and sand the inside of the boat, and then put the fiberglass on the inside of the boat. That's um, that's quite a that's quite a chore. That's probably the worst part of the whole job because you're kind of you know it doesn't work for you. It's, it doesn't fall nicely like it does in the outside of the boat. Fortunately, you're the only one who sees the inside of the boat. Everybody else sees the outside of the boat. So now there's some books, by the way. There's some really good books out here, and I gave a, the handout which lists those books that are really good. They've got a lot of different. Um, ways of doing it. My suggestion is to get at least two or three of the books because they all talk about doing it just a little bit differently. And so you'll end up, if you ever do build a boat, you end up building it kind of your own spec, uh, your own way. Also, um, Popular Science has run uh, articles years ago on building a redwood canoe, same technique, and uh, the Home Handyman uh, a few years ago in the 90s ran a uh, thing on building a cedar strip boat. Um, so, you know, there's, there, this is not a there's lots of places to go to be able to find out how to do it. And again, here's the Wooden Canoe Heritage. I'm going to put in a, a, a plug for the Wooden Canoe Heritage Association. It's a great bunch of people. We have every year we have the annual assembly, and most years it's up at Paul Smith's up in uh, up near Saranac Lake. There, wonderful place. One of the most beautiful places on, on earth. One of the best places in the world to, for uh, for paddling. It's just it's tremendous. And like I was saying, it's uh, it's like a big family reunion without the guilt. And that's what it looks like with, uh, we have about from five, five to seven hundred people that show up. And um, there's all different kinds of boats. This is the, out of the green out there at Paul Smith, if you're familiar with Paul Smith. We have that all filled up with, with all different kinds of boats. And so, <clears throat> so now we go into some of the cheesecake pictures of the canoes here. So this is a, um, this is a boat that's kind of a reproduction of that Canadian style that I was showing you, and he has two sails on this one. I don't know how you sail a two-sail boat, but it's got two sails on it. But what I had when I saw this was trailer in me. That's a trailer right there, and that's all made out of clear maple. And it was um, it was a company that was actually a boat building company, and they wanted to show off their their skills, so they built the, they had these trailers. Um, and then here's uh, another sailor, and that's got what they call a bat wing, um, a bat wing sail on it. It's just beautiful to watch one of those out on the, out on the water. They get a nice breeze, and they, they heel over a little bit, and they go right along. That boat is um, one that's called the Pretty Jane, and it's a what's called a lap straight construction, which I didn't talk about. Lap straight construction is a very old technique as well, and that's where they take uh, excuse me, they take bits of seat, they take uh, wider planks. And they lay them on top of each other over a frame, and then they put clench nails through them. But that requires there's a lot of um, uh, black plane work that has to be done to, to get the, the bevels right on the boat, and that's that's a lot of hand work. And you know, and that's a, that was a typical of the, of the boats that were made around the 1890 to about 1920. And now there's a there's a bunch of uh, sailors up on the beach, and. Uh, there's, uh, I, I, I showed this one too because that's a, a foldable boat right there with a, uh, with a, a letter on it. 
And then these are the two, uh, the two, two of them that are the lap frame construction. I just thought that was kind of a neat picture of it. On the other end, you see these, these boats sitting on the shore with, uh, with the sails on them. And of course, sometimes people like to get fancy no matter where they are. So this is a, uh, a reproduction guide boat. And they've got a, that, that whole uh, little deck there all folds up. And they have their, they can have, you can have your glass of wine or whatever. And so, um, or pure spring water, I'm sure. Uh, now here's a, uh, what's called a Grand Laker. And these are actually native to, and now this has got Vermont registration on it, but they're native to Maine, to the Grand Lake Stream in Maine, which is this big, long, it's like one of our finger lakes. And there's, I guess there's world record salmon in it or something, but anyways, they developed this particular style of boat with a flat end on it in, uh, in a, for, for mounting the motor. And that's a pretty good sized motor for pushing a canoe along. And, um, and that's in, that, so they, they, were, they were pretty native to, the, to the, this big lake up there in Maine, but um, they use them, I've seen, I've seen these, I've heard used them, like in uh, Indian reservations, in different places where you only have water access, you know, they bring in appliances and all kinds of stuff in a, in a big bowl like this. And again, this is a wood canvas construction. <coughs> now, one of the things <coughs> I can show you about is, and, and this is probably not a great clear picture, but you know, we have lots of boats, but we have lots of friends too. And um, that's probably the best part of being at, um, <coughs> being at Paul Smith's, where uh, we, like I say, we, uh, we don't see each other for, for 12 months out of the year. We come together, we have a great time, we get all caught up on what's going on, and so it's a, it's a great bunch of people to be around. Now, <clears throat> this is my, uh, my trailer. The uh, trailer is actually right outside the door here. We couldn't get it to the door. Um, and this, again, being as frugal as I am, <clears throat> you may recognize the back part of this trailer is from Harbor Freight. And, and I went and got myself a nice long piece of two by two stock and uh, built, built a couple of little uh, places to, to perch the, the, um, the, the canoe on. I'm gonna make it so I can put two boats on there here eventually. But this is real nice, it trails real nicely behind, the, the, uh, behind my, my car. And uh, the other thing is that the commercial, the commercial ones are about $1,800. I didn't spend that much for this one. And then this is how I store my boats. This is in my, uh, my garage out in Honey Eye Falls. I like to say this is the best rack in Honey Eye Falls. Um, but I've got a, uh, I got a, I, I built it so it rolls around on casters. And I've got the, full, I got the, the arms that pull it out, pull the boats out like this. So I can keep them under cover. They don't take up too much floor space because they're vertical and they're over the top of each other. And so they can, they can roll around. And I can also I keep all my accessories on there. So I got hooks and stuff around the back where I hang the paddles and the life jackets. So I know where everything is. And I can roll it around and, and you know, it's quite a, quite a nice way to, to store everything. And then of course, these are the spit kits. Uh, the, <clears throat> the people that were all at the, at the various colleges, they got me to be able to build the boats. So anyway, so there you go. Do uh, you have any, uh, any questions? Excellent question. The first boat took me, I would, I would say, probably 200 hours, the first boat. This boat I built with my son, and that probably took us together probably in the neighborhood of about 100 hours. But that was because he was learning, and I wanted to make sure he was doing it right. I built a boat similar to this, I did it about 75. That boat took quite a bit longer to do, too, because that one I had, you know, if you count all the work I did on the sail, you know, the, the boat I built one winter and the sails, the sail rig I built the next. And that was probably the neighborhood of pretty close to 100 hours an hour, too. Yeah? You do the fiberglass, do you have a, a excess of the cloth? Yep. Yeah, what you do is you let the cloth drape over. You get it close, kind of, but you let three, four, eight inches hang off, hang off. And then you can take a, a razor knife and cut it, usually cut it with a razor knife where you get yourself a whole pair of, uh, you really have to do it while it's wet, unfortunately. The worst part, right up here in the bow, because what you gotta do 
is you bring the two pieces of cloth off like this, right? And then you have to wrap, you have to, you have to, while it's wet, you have to cut it, wrap it around like this, cut the other side and wrap it around like this and not get any bubbles in it. And oh, by the way, you only got 15 minutes of working time because then the, the box starts to set up. So that's a little tricky. That part's a little tricky. Mix Absolutely. Absolutely. You make the smaller batches you because you really is is uh, you know like I make when I'm doing it I I make an, um, oh about a cup, maybe a little bit more than a cup each time I do it. Because you don't want to get too far ahead because if it's if it gets if it, you know if you get too far ahead it'll it'll vaporize it, I mean, like it, it'll sometimes it'll, it'll uh, harden real quick on itself because it works it's some sort of chemical reaction, I don't know. But there's some sort of chemical reaction that goes on there related to the heat. And if you can't if it doesn't dissipate the heat fast enough, it'll actually hard right the hot. Yes. If you have an existing spar varnish uh, wooden bowl, canoe. Yeah. How now I want to do the epoxy fiberglass. You want to put it you want to put it over a regular bowl? Put it over an existing wooden canoe. I'd ask you not to do that. Why? Because if, if, if the boat's a, if the boat's salvageable, there's there's people out there that can salvage it in its normal state, and that it, if it, if it's really an antique boat, um, that that it, it really it's it's kind of like a polyurethane on a on a on a Stradivarius violin. So if if there's any way that it, you can't, you know, that you can prevent that from happening, that's a good thing. On the other hand. On the other hand, I'd rather see it fiberglass than turn into a planter, because I've seen a lot of them. Old boats turn into planters. So yeah, if you get it clean, you get it, you get it loose, you sand it down, it should, you can, uh, the epoxy will stick pretty well to it. I would only do it just for the strain, the strain. Yeah, and you could, if you were to do that, then you wouldn't have to go the full width of the boat. You could probably put a couple of strips on there just for the strain. You know, uh, you know maybe six or eight inches wide. Down the side. So, Matthews and Fields Lumber is where I got all the uh, cedar from, and uh, that is one of the interesting things too. Is you get a chance to get to meet a lot of very interesting people in the, along the way. Uh, I was telling somebody before the gunnels on this boat were started out as a one by six by twenty foot long piece of clear ash, very unusual, and we got it from a gentleman who has a small. Uh, <coughs> small sawmill out in uh, Hilton. <coughs> Excuse me, and he saved one piece of wood because he knows there's going to be people out there. So, yes? We do a lot of ripping. What kind of Well, you know how I cut down on the amount of sawdust I had in my basement? I went over to my friend's house and used his saw. <laughs> you definitely want to use a thin curved blade, and you definitely want to have a, uh, you want to have the carbide insert. And good sharp with the wind start. <coughs> yes. Yep. So, yeah. You varnish it Absolutely. Six six coats of spar varnish over the over the polyurethane over the sorry over the uh, epoxy. <coughs> six coats of polyurethane, and the reason is is that the polyurethane's got UV blockers in it, and the the, the ultraviolet rays. Will, dis will discolor the, uh, the impacts. So that's why you really want to get the artichoke the, the, the to keep going. Oh, no. So, yes? Yeah. Any questions? Anyway, um, yes? How much uh, do you got to tie up the shell materials? <laughs> well, the last boat I built was in.
but that was uh, that's one of the things he did. He also inlaid some different colored woods in here. The other thing that you'll notice about this boat, you might not notice, you have to look kind of close compared to this boat. If you look at this boat, you can see where every one of the ribs were. There's all these little holes, right? That's where the staples were. We did this, we didn't use any staples. We did it all with clamps. That's one of the things you learn when you're a canoe builder, you can never have enough clamps. Never. Uh, and you know, we, we you clamp, you, you know, you clamp between you clamp each station, then you clamp between the stations. We wrap rubber bands around stuff. Oh my god, we use all different kinds of things, shock cords and everything. But it really looks a lot better when it's when it doesn't have all the holes in it. I agree, I did mine that way. I, I used adjustable one. Yeah, pull in between the stations. You can you can pull just perfect. Just right, yep, yep. So yeah, there's these things that, and the thing is, the reason you notice I had three or four, you can't just build one. You know, because you built the first one, you say, geez, you know, if I had done this just a little different. My first boat, I was I was concerned. I want to make sure it was strong enough. So I used six ounce fiberglass cloth. And on the outside of the boat, it's double thickness. That boat's 16 foot and it weighs more than this one, which is 17 and a half. So and but it boy is it it's a good strong boat. So yeah. You showed something called the prototype stripper. Yes. Oh, those were made, those were made, um, they're a Canadian, thank you, they're a Canadian boat, um, they were made, um, oh, no, what's the, what's the, it's the town, it's directly north of Rochester, on the other side of the lake. Um, oh, Peterborough. Peterborough, right, it's a Peterborough boat. Peterborough. It was made by the Peterborough Canoe Company. And they, uh, they were before the wood canvas boats. They were built pretty much before the wood canvas boats. 